equipment. You can see Brother Earl, you know, if you need lights and lasers and the fog machine, let me know. Uh, Brother Earl can get all of that for you. So that's Saturday. Uh, Sunday, next Sunday, we'll have all of the missionaries in here. They will be in different Sunday school classes. And, and you're going to get to meet them Monday night, Tuesday night. We have class, uh, services at 7. Then the Wednesday night that we close out the conference is our annual Texas feast. There'll be a bunch of tables filled with barbecue. Amen. Barbecue, pork, brisket, ribs, ham. You know, all that good stuff. There'll be a table of Tex-Mex, enchiladas, tacos, tamales, you know, all those other Spanish words. <laughs> There'll be a comfort food table loaded with corn on the cob and mashed potatoes and gravy and macaroni and cheese. And somebody, bless God, be led of the Lord to make hash brown casserole because that just makes me so comfortable. There will be desserts. Oh, my soul, the desserts. Chocolate pie and cobbler and cookies. Paula, are you making, cho Paula, making chocolate chip cookies? Marie, you making pie? I've got to put my order in now, amen. Somebody, Karen, Wilson, you making that mud thing? You didn't know? Okay, I'm putting you on the spot. It's on the camera. I can camp out all day on desserts, amen. But anyway, that's next, when, not this coming Wednesday, but the next Wednesday. And just because you told the preacher you would do those in church, we're not going to hold you to that. But anyway, so be a part of this. It's an exciting time. It's the most exciting uh, part of our calendar year. Brother Robert, you ready? Are you excited? All right, come lead us in a song then. Is that it? Oh, no, wait. More food-related news. <laughs> Tonight, following the evening service, we begin our volleyball spring tournament. Uh, and you guys can come and play volleyball if you want. I'm going to the concession stand. Jumbo baked potatoes. Not them little bitty things they give you at the restaurant. Jumbo baked potatoes uh, with all the fixings. Sweet potatoes for people who eat those things. Nachos. Frito pie and cheesecake with tons of toppings. Praise God. I mean, you know what? This ain't heaven, but it's sure a taste of heaven. Amen? So that's tonight following our evening service. Now, Brother Robert, come right ahead. Let's stand. If you would, please stand again. <laughs> if anything's starting tonight, you can at least gain weight in the next week with all of the food that we're going to be offered along the way. Uh, flip forward to hymn number 45, crown him with many crowns. Sing that with us this morning, hymn number 45. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon him. Shake hands with everybody. Let them know you're glad to see them this morning as the choir sings that second verse. Choir. Crown him the Lord of love. Behold his hands and side. Join us on that last verse. Crown him the Lord of heaven, one with the Father known, one with the Spirit through him, give from yonder glorious throne. To thee be in blessed praise, for thou for us hast died. Be thou. Yeah. 
go back and sing that third verse. Let's go back and sing that third verse. Here we go. Around him the Lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave who rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save his glories now we sing who died and rose on high be and the life to bring and lives that death may die. That was all four verses. All four that verses. That was all four. You're well, so you friendly. Well, you know, I've been to churches where the preacher was not friendly. That cannot be said at <laughs> that Trinity. That is not you. Man. Anybody on this side not get their hand shook? <laughs> all this food talk. Y'all aren't even going to be listening to the sermon in a minute. You'll be thinking about gravy. Amen. <laughs> Scripture reading. <sighs> All right. John chapter 4. Jesus is speaking. John chapter 4, verse 35 and verse 36. Jesus says, Say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Let's ask God's blessings on our service today. Amen. Father, thank you for bringing us here together. And Lord, I pray that everyone enjoys being at Trinity Baptist. I pray that we are friendly and outgoing. I, I pray that everyone uh, receives a warm welcome here. But Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit. We invite you to be in our service today. This is your church. And we come to worship you and, and sing praises to you. So help us, Father, to listen to your word. Help us to receive it. And God, if there's one today who doesn't know Christ as their Savior, doesn't have an assurance that heaven is their home, may today be their day of salvation. Oh God, do a great work in us. Send your spirit now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I didn't even have lucky charms for breakfast this morning. This is just the spirit.
Thank you very much, choir. If you would stand one more time, flip to number 106, hymn number 106, Worthy, You Are Worthy. Worthy, You Are Worthy. This song always shows up in my thoughts this time of year, uh, Easter, all of those things. And when I begin to think about how unworthy I actually am, uh, I'm amazed that God still loves me and cares for me. Simple song, profound question. Very simple song. Anyway, a very profound question. It just simply asks the question, who am I? And so... I pray that you'll listen to the words and apply those to your lives and realize how unworthy we are and how grateful we should be.
When I think of how he came so far from glory, came and dwelt among the lowly, such as I, to suffer pain and such disgrace on Mount Calvary take my place then I ask myself this question who am I who am I that would bleed and die for. Who am I that he would pray, not my will thine for? The answer I made never know why he ever loved me so that to an old rugged cross he would go or who am I I'm reminded of his words, I'll leave thee never, just be true and I'll give to you a life forever. I don't know what I could have done to deserve God's only Son. He fights my battles till they're all won. Oh, who am I? Who am I? that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that he would pray, not my will thine for? The answer I may never know Why he ever loved me so That to an old rugged cross he would go For who am I? That to an old rugged cross he would go. Who am I? Appreciate that, Brother Steve. Open your Bibles with me to two different locations this morning. First of all, find Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And when you have found Acts chapter 17, then find 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Acts chapter 17 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
I want to speak this morning about missions. I want you to be thinking about missions. For many people, missionaries are these strangers that go somewhere and you never see them again. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Maybe, maybe you conflate them in your mind with the bell ringers from the Salvation Army at Christmas. It's not like that at all. Maybe you grew up in a church, maybe you were Southern Baptist, and they did missions a little bit different than independent Baptists do. Maybe, maybe you were in another denomination altogether, and they, they never talked about missions or missionaries at all. I grew up in an independent Baptist church. I've known missions from day one. Uh, it's, it's been in my family, it's been in my church as a pastor for 30 years uh, I am a missions pastor. And so this morning I want to take you to the Word of God and I want to help you think biblically about the work of missions. What does it look like? What are we supposed to be doing? Because there's a lot of things that, that maybe are called missions and they're not missions the way the Bible describes or defines it. And this morning we're going to talk about the birth of a church in a city called Thessalonica. Now the message this morning is probably going to be more teaching than preaching. Uh, I found that, that a lot of folks don't know the difference between my teaching and preaching anyway. Uh, for me, teaching is when I don't yell. Amen? Uh, Either way, I go long, so that, that has no way to delineate there for us. But this may seem more like teaching, and that's okay. God uses the teaching of the Word as well as the preaching of the Word. And I believe that God can use this maybe to, to help you get more involved in missions. Now, the title of the message this morning is Fruit. In John uh, chapter 4 a while ago, we talked about uh, he that gathereth fruit unto life eternal. When I use the word fruit here, I mean the result of reward or labor, uh, of labor. Uh, the result or reward of work. That's what I mean. I can't even read it. And I wrote that. The result or reward of work. The fruit of your labor is what I mean. You go out and you get a job done and then you can stand back and look and see that happened because of what I did. Well, missions is very similar. Of course, God works in us. God works through us to save souls and to change lives, to plant churches and grow Christians. But we desire to see fruit from all of that. And that's why I chose that word for our message this morning. Now, there in Acts chapter 17, this is my text this morning, Acts chapter 17. But if you know me well enough, you know I'm not going to stay there. Look in, verse, in chapter 16, verse 9. One chapter previous, Acts chapter 16 and verse 9. The apostle Paul, a missionary, probably the greatest missionary in the New Testament, receives a vision, and there in verse 9 it says... And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, in the back of your Bible, there's probably a map or a section of maps. Do me a favor and turn back there to that section of maps for just a minute. When I teach, when I preach, when I read, I use the whole book, amen? And I want you to look at those maps. In the back, probably the last map in your Bible. If your, if your Bible doesn't have maps, the Bible in the pew in front of you has some maps. I want you to look at probably the last map. It'll have a title, something about Paul's Missionary Journeys. And I want you to look to the left side of that map. And I want you to find up in that upper uh, left-hand corner of that map the word Macedonia. Macedonia. Macedonia is a region. Alexander the Great came from Macedonia. 
And there are many cities in the region of Macedonia. One of them is the city of Thessalonica. This is where Paul is going. He'll go to Berea. He'll go down to that peninsula into uh, Achaia. He'll wind up in uh, Athens, Greece. He'll wind up in the city of Corinth. Hopefully all of these words are popping up there on that map. Okay? So Paul, what he gets this vision is in Troas. And in this vision, in this dream, there's a man there and he says, we need you to come to Macedonia. There had been no missionaries in Macedonia. The gospel had not been preached in Macedonia. Paul was going to go another direction, but he took this as leading of the Holy Spirit that this is where I need to go. Folks, this is how God works. We don't have dreams of a 900-foot Jesus who comes and sits on our bed and tells us to build a prayer tower in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, that's Oral Roberts. That's old. Some of y'all don't even know who that guy is. I was talking one night in my Tuesday night class about Oral Roberts. And a guy in my class said, that's the popcorn guy, right? No, that's Orville Redenbacher. There's a difference. Nevertheless, Paul is called to go to Macedonia. And so we call this his Macedonian call. So he's going to go to the region of Macedonia. Now, back in Acts chapter 17, I'm not going to teach or preach the entire chapter this morning, but you need to realize and maybe study on your own that in Acts chapter 17, Paul will visit three different cities. The city of Thessalonica. There they are going to resist the word. You'll see why in just a minute. He's going to go to the city of Berea. There they are going to receive the word gladly. And then he's going to go to the city of Athens. And I think Paul is going to have a life-changing moment in Athens. Because Paul was trained in theology. Paul was well-educated. Paul came from a wealthy background, and he went to Athens, which is this, this great city of antiquity, great city of philosophy, and I think Paul went loaded for bear to, to win a lot of souls, but he found out they were not ready to hear the gospel, and so they ridiculed the word. And all of these things are reactions or responses to the gospel that we find Anywhere that we take the gospel. Now this morning I want to focus on Paul planting the church in Thessalonica. Now I had you turn to 1 Thessalonians. Go over there if you would. Flip over there. 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Now 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians are letters that Paul wrote to this church that we're talking about this morning. In fact, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians were probably the first epistles that Paul wrote. Paul is going to spend a lot of time in this city, and he's going to spend a lot of effort teaching the Thessalonians about the Bible. And so when you read 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, they're short books. But you need to understand that Paul covers every major doctrine in these two books. He doesn't go into great depth, but he covers them. Because the churches need to know what they believe. And so there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, look at verse 2, because... This is how Paul remembers first going into the city of Thessalonica. In verse 2 he says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. 
Verse 4, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. As you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Verse 6, he says, and ye became followers of us. And of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Now, imagine being in a place where there was no church. You're blessed because this is Big Spring and there are churches all over town. They, they may preach different things, they may teach different things, but... In the general consensus, you at least know what a church is. The people at Thessalonica had no idea. They'd never heard, many of them, about Jesus. They didn't know that he died on a cross. They didn't know that they could be saved. And maybe you don't know those things today the way that you should, but at least if you have questions, you know where to go. For the people of Thessalonica, they had nowhere to go. But Paul, in writing this letter, says, Oh, I remember those days. And I, I see where you're at now, and I see how you've grown. And praise God for that. And so I, I just want to walk you through this process, because many people think, you know, if you're not actively involved in the church, you may believe that everything that happens in that church is by accident. I was in a church on Friday and Saturday at our men's retreat, a church that runs about 2,500 people. They just built a new building. And so uh, I walked through that building, you know, with a pastor's eye. I looked in the bathrooms and I checked out the water fountain and, and I, I, I looked at the bulletin and, and I looked with a pastor's eye. Maybe you don't do that. Maybe you come in and you sit down and, and everything works. You know, and, and, and you leave and you really don't think about what it took to make all of this happen. And it happens on a regular basis. And if you have questions about our church, we, we are an open door. If you want to know why we do something or why we believe something, all you have to do is ask. And I believe that I have a biblical answer for why we do what we do. And so Paul is going into a place that has never had this. And this is how the plan begins to unfold. First of all, I want you to see that there is a method devised. You've heard the saying, there's a method to our madness. There's a reason why we do what we do. There in Acts chapter 17 and in verse 1, it says, now when they, Paul's entourage had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia those are places on the map it says they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews let me let me highlight that for you there was a synagogue of the Jews and Paul as his manner was went in unto them, and three Sabbath days, not Sundays, but Sabbath days, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. So we begin to see this, this method that is devised by the Apostle Paul. Now, something that you need to understand is this journey to Thessalonica occurs on Paul's second trip. If you look at that map, you'll see that Paul made four missionary journeys. He made it mostly by foot, some by ship, uh, and some other means of, of travel. 
But he's going to travel on four separate journeys. And after the first three journeys, he goes, plants churches, confirms churches. He comes back to Jerusalem. He comes back to his uh, sending church uh, in, in uh, Antioch. And uh, he'll report to them what's happening in these other churches. The fourth journey, he leaves and he never comes back. He goes to Rome and there he will be put to death. Thessalonica is on his second journey. So he's already traveled. He's already learned some cultures. He's already met people. He's already preached the gospel. He's already planted some churches. And so now he has the experience. He has invested the time to know what does work and what doesn't work. You see, those two elements are very key to missions, time and experience, neither one of which we have as much as we need. It takes time to plant a church. It takes experience to build up Christians. And so Paul understood all of this. And and, and let me point out there in verse 1, they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia. They came, they saw, and they continued. He didn't stop there and plant a church in either of those two small towns. Imagine Stanton. Imagine Sand Springs, Cahoma, Fort Sand. In that illustration, Big Springs, the big city. (laughs) Paul went through those towns. Were, Were there lost people there? Absolutely. Were there people that needed to be saved? Absolutely. But Paul had devised a method. So he went to the large city of Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a harbor city. There would be ships sailing in and out. People would be there and then they would be gone. Paul reasoned, if I can get the gospel to that city... If we can get folks saved, then when they leave on a ship, they will take the gospel with them and they'll help me increase the work. The smaller towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia, that will be the responsibility of the church at Thessalonica. They will then go over to these smaller towns. They will invite folks to their church and we'll see the gospel spread to these regions. So that was part of the method that he had devised. Now, there's a lot of thinking that goes into this. You and I read the page and and we move on. Thessalonica historically was known as a free city. The Roman Empire was in power at this time. Most large cities, especially harbor cities, port cities would normally have a Roman garrison housed there. Because you don't know what's coming in, you don't know what's going out, you want to make sure taxes are paid and levied and all of those things. But Thessalonica had a predominantly Greek population because they came up from Athens. And Greeks are curious They're philosophers. They want to know what you believe and what you believe. And and, and they're, they're naturally curious. And because it's a free city full of Greeks, there's not going to be a a huge tax situation. There's not going to be any Roman soldiers to give them grief. And so Paul reasons this is a great place to plant a church. Look, I want you to understand that the missionaries that we support... They've gone through this thought process. Where will God have us to go? Where should we plant a church? Even in a city of millions of people, you have to narrow that down to a section of town, a a neighborhood. Where should I go? Where is God sending me? Paul, notice there in verse 1, it says, Now when they, Paul, Silas, a young man by the name of Timothy... They are traveling together as a team. Team missions is a biblical concept. And so they're going to the city of Thessalonica to plant this church. Now, 
Notice there in verse 1 and verse 2, the first place they go in the city of Thessalonica is the synagogue. Now, Paul is, in Romans chapter 11 and verse 13, Paul tells us that he is the apostle to the Gentiles. When Jesus was on this earth, he chose for himself 12 apostles. Judas betrayed him, all of them betrayed him, but Judas wound up hanging himself, committing suicide. And in Acts chapter 1 and in Acts chapter 2, they, they choose a, a new deacon, a guy by the name of Matthias, and the, the 12 are complete. Many want Paul to be that 12th apostle. He's not. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. And so Paul leaves Jerusalem. He leaves the Holy Land and he goes to non-Jewish places. But the Bible says he has a habit. Everywhere he goes, the first place he goes is to the synagogue. Well, why does he do that? In Philippians chapter 3, Paul tells us that he is a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He is a Pharisee. He is a Jewish man born and trained. He knows the Old Testament backwards and forwards. To him in Ephesians, we find out that God gave to him the plan of the church from eternity past. And so Paul has a burden to reach his own people with the gospel. So he goes into these synagogues because he's a, a trained Pharisee. In John chapter 4, Jesus told the the Samaritan woman that salvation is of the Jews. Jesus was Jewish. Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. It was the Old Testament scriptures that he fulfilled. Jesus will sit on the throne of David. And so Paul goes into the, the synagogue because those people are already one step ahead of everybody else. He will go into these folks that are naturally, religiously curious. He will speak to them about things they already understand, and then he will build on them. And so he has this method, and notice that he is consistent in it. He goes for three weeks, Friday after Friday after Friday. He invests some time. He invests some energy. He told the the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9, he said, For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. He would be there on Fridays teaching and preaching, and then the rest of the week he labored at tent making. He had, a, he had a secular job. Many of our missionaries today cannot go into another country and get a secular job. Because ironically, you go into another country, you're not allowed to take jobs from the citizens of that country. Totally unlike the United States. And so Paul was a tent maker by trade. And he would work and he would sell tents and he would repair tents. And then when it was time to preach, he would preach. And so he had this method devised. Second of all, I want you to see that he had a message he delivered. A message delivered. There in verse 2, look at that again. It says, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. This would be the Old Testament. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. And that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you is Christ. Now, depending on what country a missionary goes to, the methods will change. What works in London may not work in Togo. What works in uh, Eastern Europe will not work in Western Europe. Different people, different cultures. But here's what you need to know. The methods change, but the message never changes. We are not going as missionaries to feed the hungry and house the homeless. Those are worthy causes. But if you feed their stomach and, not, and never feed their soul, you have failed at the Great Commission. Jesus said, you must be born again. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23, he says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Now notice there in verse 2 and verse 3, there's four words that tell us how Paul did this message, how he delivered this message. Very quickly, he reasoned, he opened, he alleged, he preached. Let me define them for you. He reasoned, that means he had a dialogue. He went in and just had a conversation. He asked them questions, they asked him questions, he gave answers to those questions. He opened. That means he had the scriptures. He knew the scriptures. He could turn over here and he said, well, you see where this says this right here? Well, if we go back over here to this book, it's referring to this. And so he explained, he taught the scriptures to people who were naturally curious about the scriptures. It says that he alleged To to allege here means to lay alongside of. Look, when when I witness to Muslims, I need to know a little bit about what they believe. When I witness to Jehovah's Witnesses, I need to know what scriptures they use to teach their their false gospel. When I, I speak to Mormons, same thing. When I talk to Church of Christ or when I talk to a Methodist, there's a lot of baggage that comes with that, and I need to lay the Bible alongside of their teaching to show them what your teachers say do not line up with Scripture. And that's what Paul did. And then notice he preached to them. The word preach here means to announce, to herald. It means to declare that Jesus Christ came, lived, died, was buried, rose again the third day, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and will one day come again to gather us to himself. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, that Jesus was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You see, our method changes, but our message never changes. We may have a feeding center, we may open an orphanage, We may do a lot of things, but it's always centered around the local New Testament church, getting people into church, letting them hear the gospel, letting them get saved, and then training them to do the work of a believer. The message never changes. Now, Christian, you and I both need to be familiar with the message. Paul told Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I wonder, can you allege the scriptures? Can you reason the scriptures? Can you open the scriptures to someone else? I am never, ever, ever going to stop challenging you to be in the Word of God and growing in the Word of God. That's my job. That is my purpose for being. You need to know the Word of God. You may never go to Togo as a missionary, but you should go home as a missionary. You should go to work as a missionary. You should go to school as a missionary. Your neighborhood is a mission field. Chick-fil-A is a mission field. The restaurants in town, the, the businesses in town are your mission field. Now, would that God would call you to go, but regardless, you need to have the message, dare I say it, mastered. And if you don't, then you have nobody to blame but yourself. Because we are a teaching church. We are a sending church. We are an alive church. Amen? And you should know the message. And then thirdly, I want you to see that there was a membership derived. 
a membership derived. It says in verse 4, some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. Notice this. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. Now, wait a minute. Where did Paul spend three Sabbaths? In the synagogue, a Jewish building. Who got saved? The Greeks. What are Greeks doing in a Jewish building? Greeks believed that the gods had come down and lived among them. And the Greeks were tired of the empty promises that their religion and their philosophy had made. And so the Greeks came looking for spiritual truth. Can I tell you this morning, the world is starving for Jesus. Religious people are starving for Jesus. The woke crowd and all of their... They're starving for Jesus. Look, I love people. I want people to get saved. I want people not to hear my thoughts and my opinions. I don't want to have them hearing my rants and ravings. I want them to want to be at Trinity Baptist Church. I want them to be loved when they walk in this door. I want everybody to go, wow, that's the place where people treat me like a human being. Why? Because Christ died for everybody. And the Greeks were curious. Now, they had a problem because the Jews wanted to circumcise everybody. And Greeks were like, eh, you lose me with that one, right? I can't even understand how that would come up in a Sunday sermon. Uh, let's go row by row. No, we're not going to do that. The Greeks had a problem with that. And so Paul comes along and says, well, all these things you've been studying, Jesus is the fulfillment. All these things that you're looking for, Jesus is the answer. The devout women. Notice there were not the men of the synagogue. They were too smart. They were too stoic. But the wealthy women would come and they supported the synagogue. And they, they heard the message of love and acceptance and of salvation. And they received it. The Bible says they believed. That means they were convinced. That means they were persuaded. That means they received Christ as their personal Savior. And it says that they consorted. That means that they cast their lot with Paul. They joined the church. This was the church at Thessalonica. And it started in a synagogue. That's how missions work. And then those people would learn and grow. We'll find out later in Acts chapter 20 that there are two men in the church at Thessalonica, a guy by the name of Aristarchus and another man by the name of Secundus. In Acts chapter 20, they're on a boat with Paul. They've been saved, they've been baptized, they've been trained, and now they're going and presenting the gospel with Paul. That is the work of the church, to go Ba teach, baptize, train, plant a church, leave that church with the nationals. The nationals then do the multiplication work, and we go on to another place. Folks, Big Spring is our mission field. We should be growing. You need to be inviting people to church. Look, I don't know how it was when you grew up, but folks don't just come to church anymore. They show up at Easter, they show up at Christmas, but they want to be invited, they want to be encouraged, and then they want you to bring them. And then when they come in here, they want folks to be nice to them. They want folks to shake their hand and look them in the eye and say, hey, come sit with me. Hey, come go with me to my Sunday school class. Do you have any questions? What can we help you with? We want you here. Church, we need to be doing that, not just in the regions beyond. We need to be doing that in Big Spring, Texas. Bow your heads with me this morning. I hope that this teaching has challenged you. I hope that the Spirit has stirred you, Christian, church member, to be a part of the program to be an active and vital member of Trinity Baptist Church. 
Heavenly Father, we ask that every person in this room is saved. Lord, I don't know if that is true. But my desire is that everyone knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. God, I don't want to change anybody. I don't want to fix anybody. God, I want to introduce them to Jesus Christ who saved me. His spirit lives inside of me. He gives me reason and purpose and direction for every day of my life. God, I want everyone to know my Jesus. And so if there is one this morning who doesn't know Jesus Christ, Lord, let them speak to me, to Brother Brad, to Brother TJ, one of our staff members, one of our Sunday school teachers. God, today let them know that these are written that they may know that they have eternal life. Father, if there's one today who is not a, a, a member of Trinity, I pray that today might be the day you add them according to your will to our membership. And then, Father, I pray for Christians today, those who, who are members of our church, saved, baptized members of Trinity Baptist Church. God, I pray today that they don't just love missionaries. They love the missions program. They want their friends and loved ones to know Jesus. They want to share the gospel with as many as possible. I pray today, God, that you would stir us and challenge us. Get our hearts and our minds focused on missions as we enter into our conference. Father, do a great work in our time of fellowship and in our time of uh, invitation this morning. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me as the music plays, as we sing. Would you come to this altar and ask God to do a work in your heart as we sing? I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken pieces. Lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch was what I long for. You have given life to me. I will serve thee because I love thee. nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch was what I longed for. You have given life to me. Let the music continue with your heads bowed. Our service will conclude in a minute. Let's let the Spirit continue to move and work.
Amen. Let me introduce you to Patrick Newton. Patrick, stand right here with Brother Brad. Uh, Brother Patrick just came back to town and desire, he got saved and desires to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. He believes this is where uh, God would have him to serve together with Trinity. Amen. And so uh, upon his profession of salvation, we want to baptize him all in favor. Say amen. amen. And if there are any opposed by like sign... All right, Patrick, we're going to get you baptized, brother. We look forward to serving the Lord together with you. Uh, we'll be dismissed in prayer, and then you can come by and uh, extend the right hand of fellowship with him. Say, Patrick, I'm going to buy your first Frito pie tonight in the, in, the, in the gym. Amen? You may have more Frito pie than you know what to do with after this, brother. I'm going to ask Brother Mike Elliott if he would come and dismiss us in prayer as he's coming Tonight on the welcome desk, when you get here, do you have choir? We have choir practice, so choir, you'll be here first. When you get here tonight on the welcome desk, we're going to put in your hands the copy of this year's missions conference booklet. You want to be the first on your block to have one of these. We had it professionally done and designed, and uh, I'm so grateful for that. So tonight, you'll have this, you'll have information on all of the missionaries You'll have the schedule of everything and everywhere that we're going to be. Amen? So pick you up one of those tonight. And as we're dismissed, come by and welcome Patrick to the family. Brother Mike? Please pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your house, Lord, and to worship you. Father, we pray, God, that this message would just, um, just show us, Father, how we need to be out sharing your message, Lord, and just... Um, sharing the gospel with those in our communities. Father, we pray for this missions conference that's coming up, Lord, just that we would be a blessing to these missionaries, Father, and just that they would see that we are a church that supports them, Father, and will be with them as they're in their, field, in their missionary field, Father. Pray, God, that you would protect us as we go away from here today, Lord. <clears throat> Bring us back tonight. 